Versus trading. Who knows what that is? Isolations. Good. Does that mean that you'll learn something? Yeah. So, um, basically, obviously you know me. Introduce myself. Um, what this training is, it's to do with isolations. So blocking out electrical equipment, mechanical equipment, so that they can be worked on or cleaned or whatever it might be. Um, this will take you through the basic process, you know, why we do it, how we do it, and then your roles and responsibilities when that regards to that. So I'm going to go through the PowerPoint presentation, um, which is mostly the theory stuff. They've got your video in there to watch, a few examples. Um, you'll learn about the locks and the different types of equipment that we use for, for oscillating. And then at the end there will be a written assessment, two pages, just a bunch of questions. Shouldn't take you too long to fill out. Um, then I'll do a demonstration and that's pretty much it. So it shouldn't take too long. Um, it's the first time I've actually done this, so bear with me if I'm a bit slow or get a bit confused. But um, the content's there and we can look back on it if we need to. So, Sorry. first things first, um, before we get started, obviously, mobile phones, silent, ones in use. Um, it shouldn't take much longer than an hour, not even that probably, probably half an hour to get through this and then do all the paperwork out. Uh, I will get a, an attendance sheet passed around so I've got everybody's names to make sure that we cross off that. Um, and yeah, just a bit of an intro which I've already done. So it consists of two modules, isolation training, this one's protected persons. There's another one which is a more higher level one which is called for isolating persons. So that's one that I've done. Um, we'll take you through that in a minute but basically this one will mean that you're a protected person and that you can attach your personal isolating locks to equipment so that you can then be protected and you won't be at risk of any any equipment starting up while you're in there and getting injured and things like that. So, um, yeah, here we go. So, objectives. Um, so, by the end of this course, you will essentially know all this. So, you'll have an increased awareness of consequences of not isolating. So simple things, you know, injuries, equipment damage, um, things like that. You'll be able to identify some of the interesting types of energy sources and how we can isolate ourselves, how we can protect ourselves and isolate them. Correctly apply your red locks, your protection locks, um, and you understand your responsibilities as that protected person. And, uh, the other things we'll be covering, so responsibilities, energy sources, different types of locks, and also the plans and paperwork that we use to track it all. Like I said before, at the end there's a written and practical assessment which we'll go through straight away. So first up, what's an isolation? So, want to give me your ideas on what an isolation is? Swifty? Uh, isolation, so just obviously like turning off belts, making an area safe, uh, moving components. Yeah. So it's basically what this is, it's the positive separation of the source of energy from the person working. Um, so there's plenty of different types of energy um, and isolating is a, it's a literal break between that energy and a person doing work. So the process of positively blocking the energy or removing and removing the residual energy. So in some instances you might see um, particularly with pneumatic systems or hydraulics, you'll turn the valve off, you'll isolate the actual airflow, there's still air in that system because it's, it's pressurised. So if you don't drain that residual air out, you're still at risk. Part of isolating is ensuring that happens. Um, verification, so we want to make sure that once we've isolated something, that it is isolated, so we want to test it, make sure it doesn't start or there, there is no pressure there or whatever it might be. Uh, and then obviously find your locks, which is your protection. 
So positive means the, that the energy source cannot be controlled remotely. So some systems, um, there are other ways to re-energize or restart equipment. So in those systems, um, that would be counted as a positive isolation. So for us, positive means if we've turned off the breaker, there can be no other way that that, that equipment starts. Um, some forms of ineffective or non-positive isolation would be calling a lanyard, for example. So if we call a lanyard, uh, there are certain people with certain accesses that can actually trick the system thinking that that lanyard is not pulled, in which case you're still, you're still at risk. So the best way is to actually switch off the motor itself, and that way that can't be bypassed. Um, as I go, if you have any questions, feel free, let me know. Um, so we actually quick on that, don't we reset the lanyards though, once we pull them? Can, yes, but that's also why it's not a point. You're saying they can actually be started? They can, so if the lanyard is pulled, mm. and it remains pulled, mm. Bill can go into the PLC, force that lanyard back on. Oh. So even though it's physically, mechanically pulled out, yeah. we can go into the system beyond scene and go, no, nah, it's actually not pulled. Interesting. Uh -huh. So that's why it's not, not positive. Yeah. Okay, why do we isolate? So one from each of you, why, why would you isolate something new? Isolate. So why would I isolate a piece of equipment What's, what's a reason? Give me a reason for isolating something. Well, uh, preventing it from getting away from it. Uh, by other stuff. <coughs> or isolate the uh, potential uh, risky, risky dangerous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you want to you want to make sure that things are safe. It. So it should be uh, it's much, much safer for the environment for the people. Yep. So you want to protect people. people. Environment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well. Anything? No. Just stop the energy from the equipment having the potential danger. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's pretend this box was you had to work on something in this box. So these little holes are where you put your hands. Would you just stick your hands in there without knowing what was in there? So, a couple of questions to ask yourself. Does this move? So, is it a conveyor belt or an auger or a, a truck or a car? Does it move? Um, can it hurt you? So, whenever you're going around and you want to do a bit of hygiene and you're, you're walking into a, a shed or into a specific area, is there something in there that can hurt you? Simple questions like that. What happens if it starts up? You know, you're you guys are pretty new, well you two are pretty new, so you, you're probably not quite aware of some of the, the equipment or the machines that we have here. Um, so simple questions, how does it work, like tell me how it works, then I can be sure that it's that it's safe. Um, like I said, would you put your hands inside the box without knowing what the risks are? No. no. So you want to make sure that there's nothing in there that could hurt you before you, you start the work. So that's why we isolate things. Okay, so the real consequences of not isolating. Um, so there's some pretty gruesome stories out there about people that have been worked on working in inside vessels like this one. So this is for creating steel or smelting steel and things. Um, there's a story out there that's used quite often where there was a contractor working inside a, a vat similar to that. Um, and there's hot pressurised steam that gets blasted inside these vats. And what happened was they they didn't do an effective isolation. And somebody came and turned it on, basically cooked the, the poor bloke inside the vat. So I think they say that he came out as a as a red lobster. That's how they, they describe mm -hmm. him. No, not I was say, I was just like, he's a red lobster. I was like, Jesus. So these are steam. high pressure steam. Yeah. yeah, steam is so much. Steam, steam is it's quite bad. Yeah. Um, what I'll do, I will play play this video very quickly.
um, goes for a couple of minutes. It's, it'll take you through a real life example of why ineffective isolations are so bad. that he was working at at the time of his death was working maintenance in an industrial factory. Doug and I got to be friends through the Citizens Band radio and uh, we put together a Crow River radio club. Doug was working on an industrial machine and it would get debris caught on the teeth. And one of his jobs was to clean that machine up. So uh, prior to the incident that was in the machine, uh, removing the debris from the cutting devices, and uh, I think it was a faulty switch conducting the electricity to make the machine think it was in the on mode. Dad was killed 22 days before his 40th birthday. Blackout takeout would have saved his life. Would have saved his life. None of us think something like what happened to Doug could happen to us. But something as unexpected as a faulty switch box killed a good man. But a procedure called blackout tagout would have isolated the power to the machine, and Doug wouldn't have been harmed. It's estimated that proper lockout tagout procedures prevent more than 120 fatalities and over 15,000 injuries every year in North America. That's one death every three days, and almost 140 injuries every single day that could occur if not for lockout tagout. The purpose of lockout tagout is to prevent a piece of equipment from accidentally starting up or releasing stored energy while a person is performing maintenance or repairs. When the energy is locked out, then and only then can maintenance or repair be performed without the risk of injury or death. Lockout tagout applies to many kinds of energy sources, including electrical, pneumatic, hydraulic, thermal, pressurized gases and liquids, and gravity. All of these energy sources can be hazardous and need to be taken into consideration when lockout tagout is performed. For the purposes of lockout tagout, employees are classified in two ways. First of all, there's the authorized employee person who has been designated by the company to perform the lockout tagout procedure. The authorized employee is often the same person who does the maintenance, repairs, or other procedures. If you are not an authorized employee, you are designated as an affected employee. Okay, so that gave you a little bit of an intro into the next, next little bit. Touch back on this, but what do you think part of the steps, what do you, what do you think was missed in that example that was given there? As in what they didn't have in the system? Yeah, so so what what part of the, and we haven't touched on the procedure yet, we'll go through it, but just 
So the power was still connected to the machine when I said it, because they said it was a faulty switch. So therefore, if you had an isolator that didn't allow any power to go through it, then that would solve the issue of the potential faulty yeah. switch. Yeah, so in that example, uh, the contract person was working on a, on a piece of equipment that was still live, so it wasn't, wasn't effectively isolated. So the process that we have here is to you know, isolate, confirm it's isolated, then attach all our locks, um, that procedure would have saved that person's life. So he, having that procedure in place is very important. So we'll get through that in a minute, but you know, some of the other consequences of not isolating, you know, it's, it's not only the person doing the work that's risk, it could be other people that come in to, to assist, so they could be spotters. Um, could be a lack of communication or, or you know, some other, I'm trying to say, some, some other factor that, that affects the procedure. So, very important that we, that we follow the process and that we verify that things are actually locked out. Um, so, when do we isolate? So, What's some, of, what's some of the things that we might do where we might need to isolate? So there's a few things listed there. Um, but just give me an idea, just give me, give me a couple of examples of when you might need to do an isolation. Gallery clean out. Gallery clean out, yep, perfect. So what's the, what's the hazard up there that we need to, what's, what's, the, what's the equipment up in the gallery that we need to isolate? The valve and the tripper. Valve and the tripper, yep, spot on. So what's the risk? Them being left on. Machinery shot. getting crushed. Yep, so you can be crushed. Talk about the conveyor belts. If it starts yeah, up and you, you're not there, you could get entangled in it. Perfect. So, um, what about if we were working on one of the belts down here? When would we need to isolate that belt? Just when you're working in the it, within a certain reach. Yeah, so if you're if you're in a position that puts you at risk, so maybe you've removed some guarding, or you need to get in and actually work on the belt or the rollers or something, we definitely need to isolate that. If there's, if there's any risk to you or a member of that team getting tangled or crushed or engulfed or injured in any way through that belt starting, you need to isolate. So really good idea is as soon as you need to remove a belt, uh, a guard, you've got to isolate. Simple as that. A um, couple other examples here, so like I said, removing guarding off machinery, going into a confined space, we probably need to isolate any sort of equipment that's down there. Um, cell sweeping, so digits. we do isolations when we do digits. so we, we isolate the belts in, we isolate the fumigations, so we don't want to put any fumigant in the silo while you're in there, so you want to isolate those. Um, if you're installing something, you might want to isolate some things. Servicing and maintenance is probably the biggest one. So you've seen Grant and Simon here most days. They, they're always working on equipment, so they're, they're authorised isolator. Well, Grant's definitely an authorised isolator. He can perform the isolations and then do the work. Whereas guys wouldn't be able to do the isolation but you'd be able to work on the equipment once it's been isolated using these red locks which will go through. Uh, so what's um, I mentioned a couple then what what's a couple of energy sources that we might need to isolate from sort of already mentioned it but you know we're isolating uh, air wand, what's the energy source there? Compressor. Air Compressor, yeah, so Compressor. the air. Yep, so air's, a, air's an energy source, compressed air. Uh, what about, you know, I mentioned a couple before, so you've got compressed air, you've got electricity, you don't want to get electrocuted. A um, couple more here, mechanical sort of energy, so anything that's under tension, springs or belts or you know, there's counterweights on, the, on a lot of these belts, so you don't want to be underneath them. The belt snaps, the gravity's going to knock you out pretty quick. 
gravitational installed loads, that's what I just mentioned. Oops. Um, chemicals, fumigations, they're all sources of energy or hazardous substances that could be could be there. Steam, hydraulics under pressure, all pretty dangerous stuff. So they're the things that you definitely need to think about when you're particularly doing hygiene or assisting with maintenance. Um, I think of any incidents or any times where you're involved in us needing to do an isolation or want to raise any incidents and send them in into our sections which we need to work on to ourselves. Alright, so how how do we how do you isolate yourselves? How do you protect yourselves from particular types of energy at the moment? As in the size locking out. Oh, it could be anywhere. It could, be, safety could be at home. How, how, how do you isolate yourself from burning yourself while you're cooking? Don't you know? touch the hot grid. Well, yes, but you might turn it off when you finish cooking. So, sure. You know, you know, there's other little things. Mints. Other mints, yep. Yeah. So you're isolating the heat from using gloves. Not very good. Okay, here's a couple of examples of some energy sources. Here on site, so electrical energy. So any any time we're turning a switch or a circuit breaker or inside one of these orange cabinets, that's going to be an electrical isolation because we're isolating the electricity from the motor, or from the drive, or from whatever it is. Mechanical energy. So there's these silo valves. So they've got um, little screw screws inside them, and they're under a bit of pressure from the motor. So mechanically, if that drives forward and you get your hand stuck, you're probably going to chop your hand off. <laughs> Pretty dangerous stuff. Um, likewise, the conveyor belts, if you get entangled in the conveyor belt, that's a mechanical source of energy. So any movement, kinetic energy. Press air is a big one. So you've got these air receivers around the site. And something I mentioned before is residual air. So you can turn the, the valve off here, but if you've got pressurised pressure still in the hose, you're going to want to make sure that you drain that out before you do any work. Um, fumigations, so these are fumigation huts. We'll put locks on those to make sure you can't go inside and put gas inside a silo if you're working on. Obviously gravity, you've got raised loads, so Ossie was moving around a couple of motors this morning. Gravity could quite easily drop that to the ground and if you're underneath, quite easily. Um, okay, so there's two different types of isolations that we do on site. So the first one is simplex. Um, so that's where we only, we're only required to isolate one energy source at one point. So an example of that would be uh, we need to isolate the shaker upstairs for the cleaning. One energy point, one isolation point for one energy source. So we turn the main switch off, lock on that, it can't be started any other way. The other one we have is the complex, so that's where there might be two or more energy sources or two or more isolation points. So a quite easy one, like you said, is the gallery. So we need to isolate the tripper and also belt three. In that case, we're going to need to isolate two separate pieces of equipment. What we do is we put those into a lockbox like you've got behind you. Put this one here. So the keys go on. The keys go in here. And then we can lock on to, to that. I'll get to that in a minute, but that's an example of a complex. Now both, both of these isolations must have a written plan. So can't just go and isolate things and turn switches off willy-nilly. Got to make sure we have a plan for, for each one. A lot of um, a lot of the isolations that we do that we're doing frequently have pre-written plans that we like a perennial follow the plan. I don't have to go to Bill and say, hey, I've got to isolate 50 things and get him approval. I've got got those plans in place. So, 
using this board here. See, I've got three switches there. This one's got a lock on it, this one's on, and that one's on as well. At the moment, I've got this switch locked out with the yellow lock on it. Everything else is on. I'm just working on this bit of equipment. What would that be? Simplex, yeah, spot on. If I then needed to work on this switch and this switch as well, I'd need to isolate this one and as soon as I've got two separate energy sources it becomes a complex isolation and I'd have to do the paperwork accordingly. energy hubs, isolation point, protected person, authorised isolated person, isolation plan, lock and tag out, lock out device and the lock box. So I mentioned a few of these terms already. What do you think a authorised isolated person is? They're probably the ones turning the switches off and putting the yellow locks on. Yeah, so the yellow locks on. Yep, absolutely. So an authorised isolating person performs the isolation. So they've got a little bit more training. Um, they they follow the plans, put the lock, put these yellow locks on the switches, verify that they're locked out, fill out the paperwork. They'll also be the ones to probably de-isolate at the end of the job back to the operations. So that's that's the main role of the isolating person. Um, what about the protected person? What's what's their what's a protected person in this instance? Just the worker. Like you're you working in that area. Yep. You've got to put your work on as well. Exactly. It's you guys. So people performing work um, they're protected from the energy source. So the authorised isolating person comes in, isolates. You guys come on, put your red locks on, you become the protected person. So can that yellow lock come off before you guys are finished on the wall, working on that? No. Um, all right, there's actually a definition here. So two main roles, protected persons, any person undertaking work or who will in the affected area and needs protection. Individual required. So individual locks over the red locks. The authorised isolated person understands and follows an isolation plan, places equipment locks on isolation points, or they'll develop an isolation plan in consultation with operation personnel and or subject matter experts. So to be an authorised isolated person, there is extra training required, um, or you could do one of those. Can an authorised isolating person also be a protected person? Yes. Yes. Excellent, absolutely. So people like Grant, we do it frequently. He'll come around, fill out a plan, isolate a bit of gear, put on a red lock, go and work on it. So he's the authorised isolated person, but he's also protected because he's also working there. So can a protected person be an authorised isolated person? Not without further training. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay. So who's a protected person? So protected people are people who are trained or supervised by AIPs or authorised isolated persons. And they have red locks. Like this. The issue with one of these, and this is the only physical attachment. Sorry, you can only attach this to an isolation 
basically this represents you. So if your red lock's not on a bit of gear that's being worked on, you can't go and work on it. Because at any time everybody else can come take their locks off and you can still be in there.